The World Health Organization estimates that each year 4.2 million people die prematurely due to outdoor air pollution. Additionally, one study estimated that air pollution caused 210,000 premature deaths in the U.S. during 2005. The same study also estimated that car exhaust alone kills 58,000 Americans per year, which is more than the number that die in car accidents. Okay, you're probably thinking those numbers aren't super helpful because they tell you nothing about the age of the people dying. And you're right, someone dying at 87 instead of 88 is a whole lot different than a 16-year-old drifting into a pole. And it is true that unlike car accidents, air pollution deaths do tend to skew older, but air pollution still affects younger people and comes with noticeable decreases in overall life expectancy and great economic costs, especially in poor countries. On average, air pollution deaths lead to 17 years of lost life. According to the University of Chicago's Air Quality Life Index, the United States would gain 0.9 years of life expectancy by removing all fine particulate matter. Fresno, California would gain two years of life expectancy. However, the United States has relatively clean air compared to other regions of the world. Parts of northern India lose over 10 years of life expectancy due to air pollution. It's important to note that this is by removing all fine particulate pollution, which would be impossible as there are natural sources of air pollution. Most of the U.S. outside of California is regularly below the World Health Organization's recommended limit of 10 micrograms per meter cube of fine particulate matter. In addition to health consequences, there are economic costs as well due to lost productivity and decreased intelligence. One report found that air pollution costs the world $2.9 trillion, or 3.3% of the entire gross world product. The World Bank estimates an even higher $5 trillion of losses. The effects of high pollution on intelligence and academic performance are great. One study of highly polluted cities in China found that reducing air pollution to the World Health Organization's recommended limit would move people with median verbal test scores to the 63rd percentile and median math test scores to the 58th percentile. Other studies in California have found an increase in pollution leads to an increase in crime. Although the data may be discouraging, rich countries have made and are still making great progress in reducing air pollution. The average person in the U.S. lived half a year longer in 2018 than 1998 due to cleaner air, and the majority of people now live below the recommended air pollution limit. Gains since the 1970s have been astronomical. It is estimated that cleaning up the air saved the U.S. about $2 trillion between 1990 and 2020. At this point, it may be helpful to discuss the different types and sources of air pollution. Particulate matter refers to airborne particles of various sizes and is generally referred to as PM than a number in micrometers. Generally, scientists refer to PM10 as coarse particles and PM2.5 as fine particles. Finer particles are usually more harmful as they can penetrate deeper into people's lungs and bloodstreams. There are concerns that ultrafine particles smaller than PM2.5, like PM0.1, could be harmful and aren't as studied or regulated. There are other pollutants such as ground-level ozone or smog and various harmful gases, but generally particulate matter is the greatest cause for health concern. There are many sources of air pollution from the combustion of fossil fuels such as electricity generation, industrial activities, commercial or residential sources, road transportation, marine shipments, and railways. In rich countries, electricity generation and road transport are the biggest sources of exposure. In poorer regions such as northern India, wood burning for cooking and heating contributes greatly to air pollution exposure. Combustion is a main way air pollution is generated. Theoretically, in a perfect combustion reaction, hydrocarbons and oxygen react to form carbon dioxide and water in addition to released energy. Carbon dioxide isn't really harmful at low levels, though it can be if it accumulates in an enclosed space, and obviously when billions of people are releasing it, it causes global warming. However, in the real world, the ratio is never perfect and fuels have many impurities. These imperfections can cause unburned hydrocarbons to be released, as well as carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide, sulfur oxides, and ozone. Now modern fuel-injected cars closely monitor the ratio and precisely adjust the amount of fuel and oxygen getting let in and have catalytic converters that try to get rid of the most harmful particles, which is why modern cars pollute orders of magnitude less than old cars. And is part of the reason why the U.S. has made such drastic reductions in air pollution since the middle of the 20th century. It is also a small part of the reason why rich countries, even with more cars per capita, are less polluted than poor countries full of carbureted scooters. 
Electricity generation, especially coal, can also greatly contribute to air pollution. Coal is, by a significant margin, the most dangerous source of energy. Brown coal is estimated to be 442 times more dangerous than nuclear energy, Chernobyl included. In a theoretical town of 27,000 people, on average 25 of them would die each year if they got all of their power from coal. This is compared to three from natural gas or one person every 14 years from nuclear, possibly even one person every 100 years if advancements in nuclear safety are taken into consideration. It's worth noting that a coal power plant actually releases more ionizing radiation into the atmosphere than a nuclear power plant. While combustion is the main method by which air pollution is generated, believe it or not, abrasion can also generate air pollution. One study estimated that 20% of roadway source PM2.5 comes from brake dust. Researcher Dr. Mudway claimed that at this time the focus on diesel exhaust emissions is completely justified by the scientific literature, but we should not forget or discount the importance of other components such as metals from mechanical abrasion, especially from brakes, in regard to the brake dust study. Even subway systems can create particulate matter through abrasion that leads to elevated underground levels. There are concerns that ultra-fine particulate pollution may lead to additional costs that are rarely accounted for. This is still an area of active research and there is no consensus on the matter, but a lot of contemporary research points in the direction that ultra-fine particles could have more effects than previously expected. One study in California found a significant positive correlation between exposure to ultra-fine particles and incidence of heart disease. It is particularly concerning that ultrafine particles are not regulated or regularly monitored by the EPA, and ultrafine particles may be able to embed themselves in the lung, enter the bloodstream, and pass a blood-brain barrier, unlike bigger particles, which may get stopped by the respiratory system. They also may travel far from big sources such as airports. One study found elevated levels 10 miles downwind from LAX, one of the world's busiest airports. At 5 to 6 miles downwind, concentrations were still 4 to 5 times base levels. The researchers estimated that less than 5% of the ultrafine pollution in this area was from freeway traffic, meaning that the airport was a major polluter in the area. At this point, you're probably thinking that I'm secretly being funded by the antidepressant industry or something, but that's not actually the case. I think it's important to point out that despite the many downsides, abundant energy from fossil fuel use has undoubtedly led to massive increases in quality of life for billions of people throughout industrialization. Middle-income countries generally have the worst pollution as people feel the benefits of rapid growth but don't have a super-coordinated environmental effort yet. Once societies reach a certain level of prosperity, and given the massive cost of air pollution, it makes sense to focus on reducing it, which ultimately leads to massive increases in quality of life and long-term economic growth. Rich countries like the US have demonstrated that it is possible to dramatically clean up air with great benefits and little cost. The last time I checked, the average American household still owns about 17 Escalades, lights stuff on fire for entertainment, and sets the air conditioner to 65 in the summer to sleep under the covers. So it's not like most people have had to make much of a sacrifice. It's likely that the Clean Air Act is a single piece of legislation that has saved the most lives in American history. While there is certainly more that could be done, even in rich countries, the majority of Americans now live in areas with air quality compliant with a WHO guideline. Having perfectly clean air like hypothetically discussed at the beginning of the video is pretty much impossible given that there are natural sources of air pollution, and there are definitely trade-offs to be made with human-caused air pollution as well. I don't think the optimal level of air pollution is necessarily zero, but it is clear and encouraging that over time countries can convert air pollution from an ominous daily threat to something that's more of an acceptable risk. What can be done to actually reduce air pollution? Obviously, I would like to internalize the polluting to the emitter and think that is by far the most effective and efficient way to reduce pollution. As we transition off of fossil fuels because of global warming, localized pollution should be reduced too. Ultimately, the main method of reducing premature deaths due to power generation will be to move away from coal and towards cleaner options such as solar, wind, nuclear energy, and controversially, natural gas. Transitioning off of internal combustion engine cars will likely be a key to reducing global warming and local pollution as well. Electric cars aren't perfect because of abrasion and tire wear, but should nonetheless come with significant improvements. If you've ever driven a Tesla before, you know that you don't actually have to use the brake pads very much because of how powerful the regenerative braking is. Trying to encourage such behavior in the future would be beneficial. Subway stations should have good filtration systems as, especially in old stations, they can contain high levels of abrasion-related fine particulate matter. 
Well, I definitely think there should be more research on green tire design and railway abrasion. I in no way want to discourage the adoption of electric vehicles or expansion of public transportation. These would definitely lead to a better situation than now, and the effects may very well be negligible concerns. It's also worth pointing out that I've never seen a study saying that bicycles cause a meaningful amount of local pollution. There are even easier and more local solutions as well. One study found that planting trees between a house and a roadway reduced indoor PM10 levels by over 50%. Planting trees in urban areas could have positive effects on people's exposure to air pollution. In general, development can be mindful of pollution sources. It might be a good idea to think twice before putting dense development near busy highways or big airports. Well, there is at least hope on the horizon for maybe not perfect, but much better transportation and electricity generation solutions. The reality is that long haul aircraft are going to be burning fuel for many more decades. People often complain that Denver International Airport is basically in Kansas, but putting it in the northeast corner of the city, far from dense development where the prevailing winds usually blow pollution into the nothingness of basically Kansas with a dedicated transportation corridor to the city might not actually be the worst idea after all. Regardless of international, national, or citywide policies, there are some things that you could personally do to protect yourself from dangerous levels of pollution. First of all, I would avoid purchasing a house near a busy roadway, especially one with lots of heavy diesel truck traffic or downwind from an international airport. If you do live in one of these areas, or even if you don't, I would suggest investing in a high quality air filter for your HVAC system. You can also get a single room air filter. If you really want to protect yourself well expensive, you could look into a filter that filters ultra fine particles. With that being said, I also wouldn't be afraid of opening the windows unless you live in a super polluted area, as there are definitely sources of indoor air pollution as well. You could also plant trees between your house and a busy roadway. Make sure that your car's cabin air filter is up to date and preferably get one with activated carbon. It's probably best to keep the air on recirculate in heavy traffic, but make sure it's not for too long so CO2 doesn't accumulate. You can also use an app or website to check the local air pollution and avoid strenuous outdoor activities if it's too high. Don't be paranoid though and forgo regular exercise. When people discuss fossil fuel usage, they often make it sound like the consequences are decades away and that we won't see many positive effects now. But local air pollution shows that this is not the case. There are very real and concrete benefits of reduced fossil fuel usage, especially near population centers, that will be seen and felt almost immediately. The COVID-19 lockdown has shown millions of people who live in polluted cities what benefits a totally achievable reduction in pollution will bring. We have made great progress in the past, and with solutions ranging from making sure your HVAC air filters change on time to international cooperation, it is possible for this progress to continue far into the future. Thank you for watching.